If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 44. I'll remind you before we get into Genesis 44 about Joseph and what was taking place. You may remember when Joseph was born, he was born by Rachel. Rachel was the wife of Jacob or Israel uh, and whom he loved. Now she had two sons. She had Joseph and she had Benjamin. The other sons were from from the uh, different concubines, but these were the two from his wife, whom he loved very, very much. Well, you remember Joseph, when he was young, was telling some dreams he had. He had dreams where the, the sun and the moon and the stars all bowed down to him. His uh, dreams where he was out in the fields and they were, they were uh, making uh, cheese of, of hay, and all of the brothers' hay bowed down to Joseph. And so the brothers got angry with him. Number one, because his dad, Israel, or Jacob, made it very, very, very clear, my son is Joseph, who I love. Made him a coat of many colors, which, which was a royalty coat, really, showing how royal he was, but the other brothers got none of that kind of attention. So it caused a lot of hurt, a lot of anger and bitterness. And the next thing you know is what they do is they wind up throwing him in a dry well. Then some gypsies come along and they sell him. Then he gets into Egypt and he sold to Potiphar. Then Potiphar's wife lies about him, saying he tried to rape me because he wouldn't do what she asked him to do, which would have been immoral. Through all the things that we see in Joseph's life, we see that he did his very, very best to live a righteous lifestyle. He made the right choices. Then we looked at last week where he was able to interpret the dream for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, Egypt and everything except my throne yours. He's exalted. Well, between there and here, his brothers come down first, and they don't recognize who he is. And uh, so he has, has some, the money put back in that Simeon was supposed to pay, one of his brothers, Simeon was supposed to pay for the food. He put it back in the bag, so as they were leaving, he could stop them and find out that Simeon had this. Of course, he knew it because he planted it. It was a conspiracy. And some people have a problem with that. And also with the problem with chapter 44 saying, well, didn't Joseph do this because out of anger, out of rage, out of bitterness? I mean, they had really, for 20 years, they had caused turmoil in his life. But that's not what he was doing. Actually, you will see in just a moment, we'll see the hand of God all through this. This was not Joseph's doing. This was God's doing. So Simeon had to stay in prison in Egypt there with, with Pharaoh and with Joseph until his brothers could go back home and bring Benjamin. Now, you know that's not going to happen. I mean, Joseph, one of Rachel's sons, is already thought to be dead. Probably some animal guy. Remember his broken blood all over that coat? And so Jacob thought, my son is dead. There is no way he's going to let Benjamin go to Egypt with him. I mean, that's right. He's all one of his favorite sons. He's not going to lose another one. And they even tell him that. <laughs> they're saying that, you know, to, of course, they don't know it's Joseph, but they're saying, listen, here's what you don't understand. Our dad is old. And, and, and if, if we were to bring the youngest son and something happened to him, he would kill my dad. So Simeon stayed. And he said, well, when you come back, no one had come back because there's still a, a drought in the land. They had to have food. He said, when you come back, you bring Benjamin, or you'll not see my face again. Meaning, if you don't see my face, you're not going to get any food. So he's going to make sure Benjamin comes. And that's what we pick up, beginning in verse 1. And by the way, this story here unfolds in three stages, and it's much, much more than just the saving of his family. It's more than the saving of Egypt and Pharaoh. This really here, what it is, it deals just the way God has dealt with Israel. We see what he's doing here. And we see it unfold in three stages. Beginning in verse 1. He says, Then he commanded his whole his house steward, and of course this is Joseph, commanded his house steward, said, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry. And put each man's money in the opening of the sack, and put my cup, my silver cup, in the opening of the sack of the youngest. And put his money there with the grain. And so he did as Joseph had told him, and as soon as it was light, the men were sent away, and then with their donkeys. They had just left the city, and they were not far away when Joseph said unto the house steward, 
Get up and follow the men. And when you overtake them, say this to them. Why have you repaid evil for good? Is this not that which my Lord drinks? No, you stole my silver cup. This is mine. And indeed, he even uses it for divination. You have done wrong in doing this. And so he overtook them and he spoke these words to them. And he said unto him, Why do you do my Lord with such words as these? Words? Why are you accusing us of these things? He says, Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold the money which was found last time in this act, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How can we steal silver or gold from the Lord's house? With whomever the servant it is found, he shall die. That's inter interesting because this is, this is one of the brothers saying this. If you find, you know, do they know it? if Benjamin happens to be found with it, he's probably going to die and it would really kill their dad. That's what he says. With whomsoever your service it is found, wherever you find that, that, that silver cup, he shall die, and also the rest of my lords, we will be slaves. I mean, all the rest of the brothers will be your slaves. And whoever is found, then you can kill them. Then verse 10. And so he said, Let it be indeed according to your words. With whom it shall be found shall be my slave, but the rest of you will be considered innocent. In other words, I'm going to give you a little bit of mercy here. Then he hurried to each and lowered the sack to the ground, and each man opened up his sack, and he searched beginning with the oldest, ending with the youngest. And the cup, he knows where it's found, is found in Benjamin's sack. And they tore their clothes in grief and in anguish. And when each man had loaded his donkey, they returned to the city. And when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. And they fell to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What is this thing that you have done? Do you not know the man who is like me, who indeed can practice divination? So Judah said, What can we say, my Lord? What words can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? For God has found out the guilt of our servants. In other words, God knows what you've already done with Joseph. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves. Behold, we and the one who possessed the cup has been found. But he said, far be it from me to do this. The man who's in possession of the cup has been found, and he shall be my slave. But as for you, go up to your father in peace. Then Judah approached him. Now here, I hope you see the transformation in Judah's heart. Judah, before, wanted to get rid of Joseph. He's the one who wanted to put him in the well. He's the one who wanted to sell him to the Jews. He was glad to get rid of the one who thought he was better. He was willing to get rid of his, no matter how much it hurt his dad, he was going to get rid of his dad's favor. But now, there's a change of heart. Notice this, verse 18. Then Judah approached him and said, My Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears. In other words, please listen to me. Don't just let me talk. Listen to me. With your ears, hear what I have to say. Do not be angry with your servant, for you are equal to Pharaoh. My Lord asked of his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have an older father and a little boy. He is born of my father's old age. Or he's special. He's the last one born. Now his brother is dead, meaning Joseph. They thought he was dead. Because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't contact him. And he's the only one that's left of his mother, and his father loves him so. Verse 21. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down with you so that I may set my eyes on him. He's reminded of what happened last time. But he said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave the father, for it would surely kill him if he came. Verse 23. You said of your servants, however, Unless the youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. So it came about that when we went up to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us some food. But we said we cannot go down if our youngest brother is not with us. Then we can go down. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then the servant but my father said unto us, You know that my wife bore two sons. Here he is. He's acknowledging the fact that the other, 
The other ten sons were not really recognized by his father. They were not treated the same. That's the reason for some of the anguish and the bitterness that is there. She bore two sons, and one has left me. And I said, surely he was torn into pieces, and I have not seen him since. I mean, I haven't seen him for many, many years, over 20 years now by this time. If you also take Benjamin, this one from me, and harm happened to him, you will bring my hair gray down to Sheol in sorrow. So now, when I come to my servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, since I have my father's life is attached to the boy's life, when he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. So your servants will bring back the gray hair of the, of the servant of our father down to Sheol in sorrow. Verse 32. For your servant, talking about Judah, for your servant accepted responsibility for the boy from my father saying, if I do not bring him back to you, or if I don't return him back to you, then my father, you can take me to blame forever. So now, please, let your servant remain. Judah is wanting, this is a sacrificial offering off here. I, I, I want you to take me and not Benjamin. He says, take me, my Lord, to be your slave instead of the boy, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how shall they go up to my father if the boy is not with him? For I fear that he will see the evil that has overtaken my father. Three things I want us to look at in this stage. The first one, verses 1 through 3. Stage 1 is a conspiracy. We see it as soon as the morning had dawned. And of course, you know, we know that Joseph planted the, 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 the money back earlier. They gave the money back to him. Now they're back asking again. And so the father has agreed, I'll let him go back. Notice that the trust these brothers have for each other. When they ripped their clothes, they tore their clothes. They were saying, we cannot believe this. We are guilty of much greater sin. We didn't do this. We did not steal from you, but we, but we did greater sins and God has found it out. And they thought this was God's way of exposing them. Well, it was. God just used Joseph to expose them. It says, as soon as the morning had dawned, the men were sent away. The brothers were all... When they left Egypt, they were, had high hopes. Everything was great. We've got food. We've got uh, Benjamin with us. We're on the way back to our dad. Everything is great. But early in the morning, some things happen. That's what he says. And also put my cup, my silver cup, in the mouth of the sand, so it can't be missed. As soon as you open it up, you're going to see that silver cup. And you're going to see that money that they were supposed to pay for the grain. He said, also put my cup in there. These first three verses... We see God setting Joseph up in order to use him that the rest of the brothers might have a true change of heart, a true transformation. And the prayer that we see, the, the exchange between Judah and Joseph were in favor of second in command. Because they still don't they still don't realize that this is Joseph. You know, he's speaking to them through an interpreter. He's not speaking Hebrew to them, because they know real quick. They wouldn't speak Hebrew. There's something going on. So, so he's speaking to them. But they haven't had a translator. And of course, he would have been all decked out, uh, not like a Hebrew. He would have had all the, 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 the wear, the section of command, all the royalty that it would demand. So he looked like royalty. And he, so when, when Judah says, you're equal to Pharaoh, that's what he's saying. I acknowledge you for who you appear to be. The second stage is in verse 4 through 15, and it's the confrontation. Most of verse 4 and 5, that Joseph Stewart confronts the brothers on their journey. He said when they go out of the city, not yet far out, that's when the steward caught up with them. He says, why have you repaid evil for good? I love the response here. If they had not trusted each other, they'd been looking at each other, well, did Judah do it? Or did Manasseh do it? Surely, not our little brother Benjamin. I mean, they, they trusted each other. Notice he said they hurriedly, they quickly took their bags down. Let me shout. We got to get on our way. So here, let me shout. He said, there's, well, there's money. There's money. There's the cup. And he said, Benjamin's, that special cup that belonged to him, and now Benjamin has it. There, if, if they had, if they, remember, they want to get rid of Joseph, and they did. If they had want to get rid of Benjamin, now's the perfect time. He's been caught in Egypt. Let him rot. They could have had that attitude. But you see, before, when they found out the devastation that it caused their dad, when Joseph came up missing because of them, they had a heart change. 
They did not want their dad to have to go through this again. And they wondered why is this? And they said they ripped their clothes. Literally, they tore their clothes off of themselves and said, this cannot be happening. Why? Because we didn't do that. God has found out what we've done, which is much greater, and God is causing this to happen. I wonder, has God allowed tragedy or things to enter our lives? Sometimes misfortune, or seemingly misfortunes, come to our lives when we wonder, God, why me? You ever, you ever ask that? God, why me? I mean, God, I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be as holy as I can be in, in the world I live in. And, and, I, and I really am trying, but you're not all these things to come to me. And, and some of them I just really don't deserve. Have, have you ever done it before? Sure we have. We all have done it before. But notice that they didn't. What they're saying here, they rent their clothes saying, we, we will recognize ourselves. Recognize these were prominent men. These were men of wealth. These were men of integrity, supposedly. And now they are becoming that. But rather than saying, God, why are you allowing this to happen? They said, take us as servant. Just send our youngest brother back. Notice what he says here. He says, for indeed he practices divination. Now what's interesting, some, some theologians think that, that he actually did practice divination. Well, I don't think that he did. I think the reason that is used is because it's used to say this is a very, 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 very special cup to me, and you took it. Now, but however, Joseph could have practiced divination, and it wouldn't have been a sin. And the reason being is God had not yet claimed it to be a sin. God had not forbid it at that time to do it. It is later on, long after Joseph would be buried in a, in a grave. Before God ever said, don't do that. So it could, it could have been, but I don't think so. I think he walked so close with God that what he's trying to say here is, because that would have been a very, very special cup, maybe the highest cup that Pharaoh had, because he would, he would have that cup when he was practicing divination, witchcraft, sorcery, all that kind of stuff. But God said, put it out of the way. Stop doing it. Not yet, but he will. Verses 6 through 10, the brothers claim innocence. We are innocent, yet... If you'll just send our brother back home because we know our father, it'll kill him. Our father's so old he can't handle any more tragedy, any more heartache. And they're caring now about someone else. They're willing to sacrifice themselves. Well, you know what Christ did? He sacrificed himself for you and me. Joseph here is a type, if you will, of Christ because what he's doing, he's actually, by doing this, he's saving the entire family. Now we know the family's going to come in and, not, you know, and they'll stay there for a lot of years and 480 years later Israel will move out of Egypt. And uh, so anyway, he says, far be it from us your servants to do such things. Lord, we would never ever do this. We've done much worse, but we'd never do this to you because yes, we know. We know what kind of man you are. You're a man of power. You speak it and it happens. He says, with whomever your servants it is found, let him die. This, this is Judah speaking, let him die and we'll also be your slaves. See, they couldn't even conceive. There's no way we're guilty. And they certainly wouldn't have said that if they thought their brother had done it. Which in, in fact, they trust each other so much, they were willing to go to prison for the rest of their lives. And these would have been middle-aged men. They'd have had another 30 or 40 years in prison before they died for something they didn't do. But they wanted to sacrifice for each other. Notice he says, now also let me, according to your words, with him who it is found will be my slave. And so we see that Joseph Stewart in verse 4 did not repeat the offer to, of death. And some theologians ask the question, why did he not repeat it back to Joseph? Well, if God's in control of all this, God was the one guiding his speech. But I'd also say that he had seen enough carnage before, and the last thing he wanted to see was more. And then in verse 11 through 13, the cup's found in Benjamin's bag. And things go steadily downhill from there because it was, they didn't expect the cup to be there. Notice here it says they render, when it says they rent their clothes, it means out of horror. You don't just take and just tear your clothes off of you because then you're in rags. And it says then after that, they journeyed all the way back to Egypt in that condition. Everybody they would have saw was that something's wrong with those guys. Something has happened. There's horror. There's tragedy. There's turmoil. Something is wrong with them because they traveled all the way back. And bowed down before Joseph in that condition. Which was actually dangerous too if Joseph hadn't been their brother. But the reaction of the brothers demonstrate the fact that 
This was the worst thing imaginable. You could not do anything worse to this family, especially to the dad, to Jacob. You could do nothing worse to him than, than to keep Benjamin in prison forever and ever. There's a radical change that's taking place in their hearts. Before, they didn't care what their father thought. They didn't care about the favorite son, but now they do. Now they're very, very concerned about their dad and the life of Joseph, or the life of Benjamin. This says each man loaned his, loaned his donkey and then they returned. I love the fact that they quickly got it down because we're going to show you how innocent we are. And can you imagine seeing it there for a second time? The money's there a second time. How is this happening? It, the only way it can happen is God has found us out. He knows what we've done to Joseph. We're getting, we're getting repaid for that. And that's what they would have thought. And sometimes that does happen. Sometimes God allows us in our sin to a place to where God takes over. And you wonder why in the world is this happening? Because God wants to transform your heart and my heart to the heart that these boys had after, not before, the incident with Joseph. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house. They fell on the ground before him. They showed, this shows humility here. He is a very, they are very, very humble at this point. They're begging for mercy is what they're doing. So it says they fell to the ground. God had found out their iniquity. This is where stage three parts and starts in verse 16 through 34. Judah commits himself and his brothers to stick with Benjamin even though they could have left. The other 11 could have left. But he would have had to stay. A lot of people say, well, you know, he's had it too easy anyway. He's daddy's favorite. Daddy never did anything for me like he did for him. Let, let, him, let him stay. He deserves to stay. This is God's judgment on him. They could have said all of them, but they didn't. There had been such a transformation in our day. They knew it would, kill, it would kill Jacob if his son, his second son, the only one left by Rachel, were to be killed or to be put in prison forever. He couldn't handle it. And these boys loved him enough. They were willing to sacrifice and say, I don't send my brother home. And we, all of us, will stay as your slaves. God had found out their iniquity. By the way, God always finds out our iniquity. These brothers were innocent of this particular sin, but they were not innocent of greater sins. 22 years had passed from the time they thought they had killed Joseph. <clears throat> What's interesting is we find them crying out and pleading in anguish in Genesis chapter 42 and verse 11. Donald Barnhouse said this. He said, a physicist can compute the exact time that's required for the cry to go 25 yards to the ears of his brothers. Talk about when Joseph was put in the well. But it took 22 years for the cry to go from their ears to their heart. <clears throat> Do we have injustice in our life that we need to ask God to forgive us for? Are there things in our life that we need God to forgive us for? He says, here we are, the Lord's slaves. Both we and also he whom has found the cup, we will be your servants. And then Judah intercedes in what is, is considered by some people to be the most beautiful language in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. Judah recounts the previous conversations with the Egyptian official, who is Joseph. And his speech is so impassioned. Listen to this. <clears throat> then Judah came near to him and said to, to Joseph, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. In other words, please listen. What I have to share with you is the greatest important. Please, please listen. That's what he's saying. Do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. In other words, he's reminded, you've got everything. My father has really nothing except for this young lad. This is what he's saying to him here. He said, my Lord has asked his servant, saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a child of his, young, uh, of his old age who is young. One brother is dead, and he alone is left by my mother's children. And his father loves him. Let me go back through all how many times it says that his father loved him over and over and over. He says, Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I set my eyes upon him, 
And we said of my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would surely die. But you said to your servants, unless your younger brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face anymore. In other words, here's what he's saying. What you told me was if I don't bring my brother, we'll starve to death. Because without coming before your face, I can get no food. Up in Canaan, the food is all gone. I've come to you once and got food. It lasted for a while, and I need more food. And if I can't see your face, nobody else is going to approve it. You've told me the only option to, to avoid starvation. He's desperate. Judah is desperate here to save Benjamin. Concerning this impassioned speech, which, which really appeals to God here. Concerning Judah's plea, F.B. Meyer says, In all of literature, there's nothing more pathetic than this appeal. A.C. Leopold said, this is one of the manliest, the most straightforward speeches ever delivered by any man. For the depth of feeling and the sincerity of purpose, it stands unexcelled. Donald Barnhouse called it the most moving address in all of the Word of God. Because what Judah is doing, Judah is asking who he thinks is second in command in Egypt. We're going to die if you don't give us the food. And if we don't carry, if we don't carry a brother back, then my dad's going to die. He's begging, please, take me as a sacrificial offering. If you want to kill me, then kill me. If you want to be your servant, I'll be your servant. Just take me and let them go, especially Benjamin. Benjamin has to go back. Well, in verses 30 through 32, Jude explains why it's so important. You see the transformation. You see the heart has been changed. Several things that testify to this. For example, in Genesis 43, in verse 34, it shows that they did not resent Benjamin for having been given favor. When Joseph was given favor, they hated him. And they were angry with their dad. And we can understand that. Maybe some of you were raised with a brother or sister that, that they, they said, my mom and they loved them all the time and they just somehow never really took care of you. And it does cause bitterness sometimes. But they had grown so much where they were beyond that. And that's what Christians are supposed to do is go beyond it. You know, typically, in, at least in, in my age society, and I guess that gets older every year, but people my age, most of the time, the mothers are closer to the sons, and the fathers are closer to their daughters. And that's just a natural thing. My dad did dote over my sister, but I never got upset about it because I understood that. Even growing up, even when I was in, you know, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade, I knew that, you know, that uh, my dad favored my sister. Of course, he always treated me fine, but my mom also treated me better than she treated my sister Kim. You know, it was just a natural thing. They both loved us, I think, as much. But there are some homes where that is, it goes to the extreme and everybody doesn't have somebody like a Joseph or a Benjamin. Then we can understand why, because it was Rachel's kids. I want to remind you that Jacob, who changed his name, name was changed to Israel, he wasn't perfect. He was a man of God, but he wasn't perfect. And so loving those two boys more than the others, really, he shouldn't have done that. But the boys had gotten to a place where they forgave him, and their dad was more important than their own freedom, than their own life. Jesus did the same thing for us. They stuck together when the cup was found. You know, it could have been, uh, well, he said, his bag, not mine. I had no knowledge of it. Take him away. But he didn't. They stayed together. They humbled themselves for the sake of Benjamin. These men are not the same men that we saw 20 years ago but not literally 20 years ago, last week. But 20 years earlier, these are different men. These are men who would not give him up for anything. I love the next chapter. We'll look at it next week, maybe. Joseph became so overwhelmed of what he had seen, he started crying and he had to excuse himself. And he cleared the house, except for his brothers. And he comes and he says, they're afraid. You're, you're, you're going to kill us. 
And he says, I'm not going to kill you. I'm your brother, Jefferson. Wow, what a, what a moving thing to happen. How did it happen? They would have never got to that next chapter if they had killed him or put him in prison. There would have been a heart change, a heart transformation. And that's what needs to happen in our hearts and lives today. If there's any jealousy, if there's any sin or whatsoever that's in our life, any animosity toward anyone, we need to be forgiven. And the only way to be forgiven is to ask for forgiveness. There was a transformation in these boys' lives. It needs to be a transformation in our lives. And if you come to a place in your life where you repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus, then all these things should be moving out of your life. We won't be perfect, but we should be more perfect today than we was yesterday and more perfect tomorrow than we are today. We'll never reach total perfection here, but there can be transformation, just like there was in these other ten boys. Because he had twelve sons, you know. And Joseph and Benjamin were just the favorite ones. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me just ask you a question.